been taking a look at hope in a world that's not our home. If this earth is our home for eternity, we're all in trouble uh, because God has something so much better in store for us. Following along with some of the things that uh, Pastor Rowe said, it just fits perfectly with what I'm going to share briefly this morning in 1 Peter 4, 7. Now, I think we have the scriptures, uh, so let's, I'll read it out loud, but you can read it in your mind. To the first period there, it says what? The end of the world is coming what? Now, I used to live closer to New York City, and we liked to go into the city, and we would walk by St. Patrick's Cathedral. And I loved going into the cathedral because it was so awesome and majestic. But sure enough, there was always somebody with a signboard out there yelling, the end is coming soon, the end is coming soon, repent, uh, you're all going to die, something, whatever it was. And I remember there's a, there's a, a walkway there, a crosswalk, that had, you know, don't walk and then walk. And so it would say walk and the guy would start yelling at people, repent, you're going to hell. And then it would stop walking and he would stop preaching. Or it was the other way around. Whatever way it was, he preached based on what the light was. Now, I don't know the effectiveness of that. Uh, I don't know. That's not my decision to make. But there is truth in the fact that Jesus is coming soon and we need to be prepared for it. So here's 1 Peter. This is the Apostle Peter, you know, the, the, the one apostle that we probably know the most. He wrote this in the neighborhood of 2,000 years ago to a church that was removed from their friends and family. They were foreigners in a foreign land, and he was trying to give them hope in a, a land that was not their home. And he says them to this 2,000 years ago, the end of the world is coming soon, period. Well, here we are 2,000 years later, and Jesus still hasn't returned. And so I want to tell you something important. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. You don't know when Jesus is coming back. And anybody that says they know when Jesus is coming back also doesn't know when they're coming back. And the ones you have to be worried about is the ones that think they know when he's coming back because we don't know. Here's what I do know. We're closer now than we've ever been. If Peter said soon, because again, even Pastor Rowe talked, you know, God is outside of time. He doesn't operate on our schedule of things. But Peter said, the end of the world is coming soon. So what I want to talk to you about today is four simple points of while we're waiting, how are we to live? Okay, we know Jesus is coming back. We know that. We don't know when. But while we're waiting, how do we live? And Peter just lays it out so simply for them uh, in, in these verses. And I'm not going to, I have a lot of different verses and things. Uh, Romans 13, 11, because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Paul believed Jesus was coming back soon. The early church, uh, James believed uh, that Jesus was coming back, the brother of Jesus. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. We believe that. That's Christian doctrine. We believe that Jesus is coming back and he could come back at any time. How then are we supposed to live? And I have four uh, brief points. Pray, love, share, and serve. Pray, love, share, and serve. So at the end of this verse, after the first period, it says, because that is true, therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. The first and most important relationship we have is with God. And we would call that vertical relationship. Our relationship to God is first, and then everything stems from that relationship to God. And how do we have a relationship to God? How do we stay close to God? Well, one of the key ways is prayer, by just spending time with God. Now, I'll just tell you how I, I do this uh, on a regular and daily basis. Um, I'm not the world's greatest prayer that's ever been. Uh, you know, I'm just not real, real good at it. I go into situations and don't know what to say and don't know what to pray. And I, I find myself a lot of not knowing what to do or, or say. And I also find myself saying things I probably shouldn't, but that's a story for another time. But what I do on a daily basis is I just recite the Lord's Prayer. That's all. Our Father who art in heaven, and, and all the way through. But what, I, what I'll do is I'll take time to stop at one of those phrases and reflect on that a little bit more. 
and I'll show you, you know, how I do that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just go at the beginning, you know, our Father. And I'll just, I'll, I'll just say the whole prayer, and then I'll stop at our Father, and I'll, I'll think about, wow, to think that God Almighty, the, uh, the creator of the universe, is not just a mean, he's not a mean God, not just a mean, not a mean God. He's not an angry grandfather that's waiting to punish. He's a father to us. And that really connects with me because I'm a father. And what do I want for my children? I want their best. And what does God want for me? He wants the best for me. And so I begin to reflect and thank him that God is not against me, but he's for me as I am for my children. You see how this plays out? And I begin to focus my attention on who God is. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then I might go through some of the names of God. Just, you know, and just worship him and pray. What am I doing through all of that? And what I encourage you to do, if the only prayer you know is the Lord's Prayer, I can assure you that one's actually enough. Because that's the prayer that Jesus taught them to pray. And if Jesus taught that prayer, then I'm thinking that's okay. As we grow in our walk with the Lord and mature and we learn more about God, well, then that prayer can be taken and you can go Go with it, but let that lead your prayer. But the important thing is that you're spending time in this vertical relationship with God because when Jesus does come back, I want to be in right relationship with him. And how do I do that? Through prayer, through prayer. Earnest prayer, it says. Earnest, it just simply means sincere, that I'm really calling out to God, that it's more than just, you know, God bless the food that I'm about to eat. It's more than that. And that's good. I pray that prayer several times a day, by the way. Uh, but, you know, you know, that earnest prayer, the, the disciplined prayer, meaning the, the consistency of it. An athlete is successful because they're disciplined in their training. And it's the same for us as as believers, that we're, when, the more disciplined we are, and you, you might think of yourself as undisciplined, you're not. Okay, you're not because you woke up this morning. There were 10,000 other places you could be. Those of you with, the, with, with small children, you multiply it by like 1,000. Just the fact that you made it here is, is awesome, you know. But for the parents of youth uh, and your kid was up here, was it worth it? Yeah. You know, all those times that you got up and didn't feel like it and you still got ready for church and you brought your kid to church and you fought with your wife uh, in the car on the way there and then when you got to church, you pretended like everything was, was wonderful uh, and all of that, you know, uh, and that's okay because you don't have to feel perfect or you don't have to be perfect to come to church. There's something supernatural that takes place somehow when you walk through the door because you just established, God, I'm going to give you the first part of my week. And then I'm going to trust the rest of the week into your hands. And what happens is, you know, uh, to become a great athlete, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes years of discipline to win the medal or, you know, the award, whatever it is. You know, the same is true in our spiritual walk. Sometimes to see all of the benefits and blessings, it takes years but from 11 to however old the oldest one was, uh, we see the benefits of it. And so you are disciplined. You are disciplined just being here. Read the word every day. Read the word. The, the youth talked about Andy Lynn, who was with us last week, he came down to give them all fire Bibles, which is uh, 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 Assemblies of God. And so, oh, there it is. Can I have that real quick? Thank you, dear. I actually hadn't seen this till now. All of our youth got this fire Bible. That's why Andy came down, so that they all have their own Bible. And I have, yeah, and it comes with, now I would never be able to read this, not because it's not the word, but the words are too small. <laughs> That's the, <laughs> uh, in that. But it comes with, um, it's like a study Bible. So it explains the scriptures to them. And I use this, fire Bible. I have it on my computer and everything all the time. I mean, this is one of the most dynamic and powerful study Bibles uh, in the world today that we have uh, a whole organization, thank you dear, within the Assemblies of God to distribute the fire Bible to nations. Uh, we, we have pastors in other countries that they were called to ministry but have no training 
whatsoever. They just know that God's, well, you do need some training because you can fall into false teaching easily, just like anything else. You know, I want to be a chef, but I don't want to learn how to cook. Well, that might not help. At some point, it's good to be a chef, but you kind of got to learn how to cook. These Bibles go to train pastors. So now all of our young people, because they were here and you brought them, have the Word of God available to them that they can trust and that that fire Bible doesn't tell them when Jesus is coming back because we're not all crazy. We don't know when he's coming back, but it does tell them that he's coming back and that studying God's Word and prayer is an important part of our vertical relationship. Okay, number two, uh, love. Look at it. Verse 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers what? How? Thank you, Lord, <laughs> that you cover a multitude of sins. For the, for the youth that have your Bibles today, I'm, I, th I sometimes use the New Living, sometimes New International. So if you're following along and the wording isn't exact, it's, it's close uh, in that. Anyway, love. Most important of all, continue to show deep love. Watch. Watch my hands. Vertical relationship changes horizontal relationships. See? But it starts with our relationship to God, and it helps us in every other relationship. It's basically the two greatest commandments. Love God. Love your neighbor. Okay? It's what makes our church so weird, is that we actually love God, and we actually love each other. It's the craziest thing. Not every church has that. Not every church do they love God and love each other. A lot of times churches fall into the trap of loving their church, but not loving God. And loving their traditions as a church, but not really loving God. And then anybody that disagrees with their idea of church, they don't love them either. We've got a weird situation going on here. And that's why God is working so mightily in so many lives and in so many different ways. We just love God and we love each other and we forgive one another because love covers a multitude of sins. I, I think the greatest blessing that you have given to me, um, and there's been more than I could name, is you've shown me grace in these 24 years. I was 32 years old when I came, had never pastored a church like this, didn't have any idea what I was doing, and at each stage you showed grace. Now, 24 years later, I'm 57 years old, and I still have no idea what I'm doing, and you continue to show grace. Love covers over a multitude of sins, and that's how we need to love one another. We all have faults, and the more you know someone, the more faults you can see. Like, if you think everybody here at the church is perfect, it's because you're just not involved enough. Like, if you would work in the kitchen for one of our, this is a joke, okay? Shout out to church kitchens. If you would work in one of our kitchens for a large event, you would know that, hey, we're not all perfect, and we, we're still working at it and, uh, and, and all of that. But you know what? At the end of the day, we love each other, and love covers over a multitude of sins. And, you know, you wanted to put the bowl on the, the, the table, and I don't put the bowl on the table. Well, it doesn't matter in the long run of things. You understand what I'm saying? Vertical relationship, horizontal relationship. Love covers over a multitude of sins. Now, let me relate this to something I can understand. Love covering over a multitude of sins is like the sauce on the pizza. That when you stretch out the pizza and you make it round, it's not completely perfect. But when you spread it with some sauce, put some cheese, on top, bake it, the, bake it the proper way. Easy, I'll take that Bible away from you. <laughs> you. You just bake it the certain way. What happens here? You don't recognize that there were some imperfections in the crust because the sauce, love covers a multitude of sins. Amen? Amen. Let me keep going. Number three, share. Verse nine. Okay, verse 9. What's the first two words? Cheerfully what? Okay, see, I'm not making any of this up. This isn't like uh, uh, homiletical tricks. It says cheerfully share. 
How are we to live while we're waiting for Jesus? Well, we cheerfully share. Now, I'll give a little context to it. You're home with those who need a meal or a place to stay, and that's still good, but I would be careful with that, okay? I wouldn't open your home to, to everybody and anybody and all of that. We don't live in that day. But in that day, they're talking about other believers that lost their home. They didn't have hotels. They didn't have restaurants. Other believers had to rally around and help one another. We're not talking about dudes that you know, want to rob you and you welcome them in your house. That's not Christianity. That's a different religion, and it's called stupidity. Okay? Anybody that's going to come in and harm you and your children is not Christianity, it's stupidity. Okay? Sharing is about understanding we've been blessed. And what we have, God gave it to us, and we want to bless others. I mean, that's basically it. And what happens is, I didn't see anyone take a box that was angry or frowning. And I didn't see anyone that brought it back angry, miserable, frowning saying, oh, geez, I, I hate doing this every year. No, we didn't even have enough boxes the first day. We had ordered more. They weren't even folded yet. Why? Because our church gives cheerfully, you know? And I used to say, if you can't give cheerfully, then just keep it. Now I say, well, give it anyhow with your old miserable self. Because <laughs> God will take your rotten money and he'll use it for his glory. So if you're miserable, still give, still give. Let's not be crazy. Uh, but you know what I've found through the years, and I know you have too, is the more you share, you're not miserable at all. Isn't there something exciting? And this is just a practical example. Isn't there just something ex exciting about this? Isn't it exciting? Isn't, this, isn't it exciting to see our young people up here? And, you know, whether you gave specifically for that, if you give to the work of the Lord, you gave to that. Pastor Roe gets paid because we give right? The kids go, we have a van and gas and all of that because you give, you're all a part of this. And some of our people went over and above. They said, you know, our kids are grown, but we want to give specifically. And if God told, it was wonderful. And not one of them said, well, I don't want to do this, but no, no they're like, you know, God's been so good. How can we not? That's giving cheerfully. So what are we doing while we're waiting? Well, we're maintaining relationship with God. We're growing in our relationship to others. How? Loving them, covering over a multitude of sins. I didn't get into this today, but you know, forgive those that have harmed you. That's part of the Lord's prayer too, right? Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And maybe that's something you need to work on. I'll just throw that out to you. Let the Holy Spirit do his work give you some quick thoughts. I know I always say that, and I don't mean it, but these will be quick. Forgiveness is not forgiving and forgetting. If you've heard that, that's stupid too. Sorry, I use the word stupid a lot. There's a lot of stupidity out there. If you've really been hurt, you're not going to forget it. Who, who can forget that? Forgiving is this. Every time you remember, forgive them again. That's what forgiving really is, and it's a process. And what happens is every time you remember and you forgive them, it becomes easier, it really does. It's not minimizing what they've done to you. It's saying, you know what, God, thank you for forgiving me. I'm gonna forgive them and I'm not going to let the hurt that they've caused ruin my life. I'm gonna live my life for you. That's what it means, okay? And we'll let God take care of the vengeance, which he says he will. We'll let him handle that. That's his responsibility. So we share, we share uh, cheerfully and our church is just crazy ridiculous at that. Uh, I can't even, I could tell you story after story, but, um, the, and then the fourth one and the last one is verse 410. God has given you each, uh, given you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to what? Serve, okay? To serve one another to serve one another. And then it goes on. I don't know if we have this one. I think we do. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. And he broke it down into two, those two things. But look what it says. God has a great variety of spiritual gifts. He just broke it down into speaking gifts and serving gifts. Some are better with their voice and some are better with their hands. Even the structure of the church is established with the pastor leads with his voice, the deacons lead with their hands. 
You see how that works? So that's just these gifts on either side, either with your voice or with your hands, but you still serve, and, and whatever your gifting is, then use it. I have no gifting with my hands other than to pick up the fork to the glory of God. Like, I can't fix things. I can't. I'm just not good at that. And somehow my son is good at it. He must have got it from Dora's side. Well, my side, the rest of my brothers were always very handy. I, it's just me. I'm just a mess. But I can't fix anything. And so Joseph and I were doing a project. And, and he says, well, we're going to do this, this, and, and this. And he had it all laid out in his head. And I couldn't even visualize it. And I'm looking at him. And he could see the look on my face. And he goes, just get me the tools. <laughs> Perfect. Joe, you want to preach on Sunday? No. See? But God has given each of you a gift. Every one of you. How about some of these kids up here? Wow. Riveting. But whatever gift God has given you, use it for his glory. Dom Simone is in the hospital. He had at least triple bypass, I think it was. If you know Dom, they sit in the back there, and Frank and Maria and Mar Becky and Marcello were going to visit him today, and, and he's doing better. I got a text from Vivian during the service. They removed the tube, which was the big thing that he wanted because he wanted to eat. <laughs> so they removed the tube. He's actually, in, in, you know, for everything he's going through, he's doing, doing very well. Well, Dom... Uh, is good with his hands and so is, so is Marcello. Neither of them want to speak. In fact, some of you have known Dom a long portion of his life and you've never heard him even speak. But when we needed help putting the playground together, Dom and Newt, who's also relatively quiet, especially compared to Linda, They were, they were out there. Now, Newt's probably not, I don't know, maybe you will preach a sermon someday. I know, I don't know, but that might not be your gifting. But he's great with his hands. Dom's gifting is not to speak like I speak. But here they are working on a child's playground so our children can have a safe place to play at church. That's what I'm talking about. That's how it works. Share your gift. You have it for a reason. The gift you have is because God gave it to you you might have fine-tuned it through work. Like some people have the gift of music, but they still practice. They still work at it, but you have a gift. Use it. If you're not sure what it is, try something. And if it doesn't work, try something else. Your life's not going to end because the first thing you tried didn't work. You know, when I was 16 years old, I sang a duet in church, and I hit a wrong note, just one. Just one. And I, never, I didn't sing again all the way through high school, through Bible school, until I was youth pastoring. My pastor heard me singing along with the, whatever we were singing. He said, next week you're leading worship. Because I hit one wrong note, I decided I was never going to sing again. What a waste. What a waste of time. Thank God I didn't waste my whole life. Not that I'm the world's greatest singer, but I can sing now and I do it for the glory of God. Because I hit one wrong note. And you know how life is. You sing 10,000 right notes, but you hit a clanker. And it's brutal because everybody knows it. Even if they can't sing, we know whether you hit a wrong note. You know, maybe you've hit a wrong note in your life. It's only one. Don't waste your life focusing on that one note that you hit wrong. God's got great things in store for you. Karen's a professional musician. She plays multiple instruments, teaches. Now, she might, I'm putting her on a spot. You don't ever hit a wrong note, do you? They hit lots of wrong notes, but, but guess what? You still help children learn instruments? Yeah, because you use that gift to serve. She's hit wrong notes, and here she is still serving the Lord. Amen? Sarah, piano player, beautiful. Have you ever hit a wrong note other than Mary? No, I'm sorry. No, 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 it didn't come all the way out. No, no. It didn't come all the way out, so don't ooh. That was you thinking it. I love you too, Ray. I, was, I really honestly was trying. All right. Let me, let me close. Look. Look. Jesus is coming back. 
and we don't know when. But if Peter, James, Paul, and all the apostles thought he was coming back soon, certainly it's closer now than it's ever been. Be ready, first of all. We talked about that last week. Be ready. Make sure you're in right relationship with God. We can help you in that. Maintain that right relationship with God through prayer, through scripture, and then love others, share with others, and serve others, and you'll be ready for whenever God comes, and you'll be thrilled to see that Jesus is on the horizon, that he has come for his church, and that we will spend eternity forever and forever. Why do we love others? Because Jesus loved us. Why do we share with others? Because Jesus shared with us. Why do we serve others? Because Jesus served us. That's all. It's Jesus in a nutshell. Amen? Amen. Amen.